Well, my background is is somewhat similar to Holland, Michigan, in that I grew up in a Dutch American community in in Wisconsin, Alta, Wisconsin, and uh, went to high school there. And then, but I came to Hope College because members of our family had already come to Hope. In fact, the first one started in 1882 already, and I think my grandson, who graduated two years ago, was about the 30th member of the, what I call the Bruins clan to come to Hope College here. And then I went to Western Seminary, and then I did graduate work in New York City, a Union Seminary, and then got a degree at New York University. Then got the uh, opportunity to come and teach at Hope in 1966, and I became a member of the religion department there. And my field is uh, Amer American religious history and history of the Dutch Reformed Church. And so my books that are all behind you here are from... Uh, are, are really all Dutch American and also there, so that I collected a lot of stuff doing Dutch American. That caught my interest. But then in 1994, the Heisinger family, some members who live here, and Peter Heisinger, who lives in Oak Brook, Illinois, uh, founded the Van Ralde Institute. So he took a great interest in that, and he appointed me the first director, so I had to get the institute underway. Well, I think it's very important for a community or an institution or for a person to know where they came from. What are the, what is their history really, and 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 what what heart, what in, in, in heartens me now is that so many people are interested in their family histories, and I've done that too. So now in genealogy and with the computer now you can find so much, so much stuff about your family, and uh, where did they come from. And not, unless you're a Native American, you've come from somewhere else. Your family has come from somewhere else. And so, and so uh, what can you do? And continue to live a fruitful life and stay occupied. Because uh, I think as long as, we, and I've been blessed with good health here. I was 84 now in July. I've had good health and can come to work every day. And this energizes me and I feel like I'm doing some good work. And yet, uh, I say I don't punch a time clock. So that when my wife and I want to do something, we're in different groups and things like that. It's just that uh, I think it's part, uh, important part of the Christian life that you stay useful. Uh, because I think studies have shown for those people who just sit down and watch TV and sit in an easy chair don't last all that long. This gives purpose to life. And you hope you're doing some good yet. church where I'm a member and I've been treasurer for many years, but I went, went to work uh, mornings and did that for 15 years, and uh, that stint is just ending now after 15 years. Oh, I love working for the Hall Community Foundation and being president of the Hall Hospital Board and president of the Hall Board of Education. Uh, it just gave me a just a thrill to be able to do that kind of a thing. Uh, I learned to work when I was a kid during the Depression, so it came natural for me to have to get up and go to work, and especially doing something for the community. It was great. Uh, serving on the Board of Education, uh, one of the things is we, we had to take care of the, or make sure that the schools were built properly and uh, functional, and uh, uh, we decided that we had to have a swimming pool and uh, attached or, or supervised by the, by the board rather better than uh, contractors. 
orders coming in, you know, and uh, I was adamant about having a swimming pool and that be shared by all the community, including the, the uh, all the Christian schools in St. Francis and uh, the other small schools around. So we had to have a vote for that, and uh, so I spent many nights making presentations. And, story, which I did, and uh, he says, you got your money, which was a thrill for us to be able to go back to Holland and tell our people that we got the money, at that time it was an anonymous gift, so that was, I think, a very happy time for me. Um, I played the piano from the time I was five, and I could always play by ear. It's nothing to brag about because it's just something you can do or can't do. So I played T for two, etc. when I was a kid. And the uh, first piano lesson was 35 cents wrapped in a handkerchief. And I got lost on the way to my teachers. Nothing's changed. I still have no sense of direction. But I grew up in a small town and played more basketball than piano, I think. But when I went to college um, at a small school similar to Hope, Lebanon Valley College, I saw the light and realized I was about 10 years behind in my practicing, so I started practicing four, five, six hours a day. <clears throat> and I loved music, and I really thought about not much else. Basketball went by the wayside in college, and I went to New York City to grad school, Manhattan School of Music. Um, when I arrived there, my parents dumped me out at the building where Robert Mann lived, the first violinist in the Juilliard String Quartet, and I went to the 25th floor, babysat his kids and lived there for half a year, and uh, went to school, got my degree there, and then I stayed for 13 years and a company playing violin studios, voice studios, ballet, modern dance, and played concerts and kept on studying. I lived in the old Metropolitan Opera House on the fifth floor for three years before they tore it down, which was a sad day. The phone rang one day and I picked it up and it was Anthony Koiker and uh, a very distinguished pianist from the Hope faculty and he said, how would you like to work at Hope College? And I said, what's Hope College? I'd never heard of Hope or the RCA. But I flew out for an interview, drank 11 cups of coffee on the plane had to play the interview and audition in Snow Auditorium, and I was shaking so much from the coffee, I don't know how I played a note, but they must have been desperate, so they hired me. <laughs> and I went back and told my friends, oh, they said, you're going to hate it, you're going to miss us, and you're going to miss New York. But, um, and I have in a lot of ways, but I loved the job, it was perfect for me, and has been, and I stayed at home for 33 years.
Ground Zero in Michigan. And I grew up in a family of seven kids. And I graduated from Zero in high school. And after, uh, after one semester at Wheaton College, west of Chicago, um, I found myself in the Army, like most of the guys did in those days. And I spent three years in the Army, World War II. Part of the time, the uh, Army sent me to school. I was a pre-med student, and they sent me to uh, the University of Pittsburgh and Haverford College. And then they sent then they sent me overseas to Europe. And I was a medic in the Third Army. And uh, after the war, because uh, they had so many so many uh, young guys around Europe, they had to do something with them. One of the things they did was send you to school if you want. I worked uh, at Herman Miller for 40 years. And uh, I, I had a number of, a number of uh, different positions with the company, uh, including actually back to Europe for another period of time uh, running international operations. And then, uh, then in the early 70s, I think it was, uh, because of the fast growth going on, we uh, had to take the, pump, the company public. And uh, at that time, I was chairman of the board, and later uh, as the CEO. And let's see, and, and I, I retired as CEO at about, I think I was 63, and uh, continued on as chairman for another uh, seven or eight years. So I think I retired from the company uh, in uh, 1995. Uh, well, I think, I think the most important part of this is, the, uh, is my involvement at Fuller Seminary. I went on the board there in 1964. served for 40 years on that board. And, and I must say that next to my family, that's been the most important thing in my life. And I really, and I really feel that was a calling. And the, and the time at Fuller Seminary also complemented the mentoring. Those involvements also contributed to the writing. Uh, you know, when you, when you mentor somebody over a period of several years, you learn a lot about each other and you learn a lot about life. And um, because it, because mentoring is only good if it's a two-way street. So um, those, this uh, this work at Fuller and the mentoring. There was a there was a there was a natural move into the book writing. So that's that's what I did, and I love it. I got to a point where I liked to work, but I didn't need to earn a living anymore, and I thought I'd like to I'd like to of help and service to others, basically. Well, first of all, us kids, you know, a family of four and us kids all were taught to work. I think back in those days, that was just a standard fare. Everybody, you know, worked a lot. And so basically, we worked all our life since we were little kids, earned our first bike on on. But uh, I I had a career in accounting and finance, which which was a ball. I didn't even seem like work to me, you know. It just came naturally to me, and, and then I was just lucky enough that I went. I, I got about 10 years as a landing officer out of college with the bank. And then then I went to work for Lou Ziegler as a financial analyst, which was a ball. It was really sophisticated stuff, and I loved it. 
But then I got, so I thought, I got to do something better with my life than be involved in making equipment to bomb people. I find that I got to be careful. I, you got to be careful and not get yourself so involved in too many things that you don't do a really nice job with it. And the other thing is, is I really want a, a balanced life. You know, I like, I like to share my, my special skills. I think I just happen to be a natural at, in the county financial areas. I think God just, I was born where it was just, I, it was easy. <clears throat> and I'm doing the numbers, the consistory members often would say to me, Roy, I'm, you know, ever since you took over the treasury function, we don't waste our time anymore getting all lost in the church finances and we can concentrate on the spiritual matters of the church, which is what we're all about. Well, I feel like I've been able to do that for the orchestra mm -hmm. and for Can Do and for Wings of Mercy and for these companies I'm on. Uh, they can concentrate on the business they're in when I've taken some of the mystery. I don't know why it is a mystery to them. I take the mystery out of it, and we can move forward in the financial area and not let it get in the way of what you're, all, what you're really there all about, you know. So I've been able to do that. I guess the most significant first thing I can say is that um, actually I'm an incredibly unlikely person to be doing this. So I did, I entered, went to Hope College as a math major and um, I was always good at math and I, I'm one of these weird, weird people that have bright and left brain both. I've been, it's an affliction I think. And so uh, I, uh, most of the musicians as side of the brain that um, is very artistic. They can salivate over this wonderful, great music and don't know where the room key is. You know, that's, well, I'm not like that and I can't do anything about it. So <laughs> I have an advanced planner and so on. So I, uh, I was a math person and um, soon became interested in doing music. And uh, it's a long story, but I got into uh, uh, as the possibility of a music major and I was a drummer of all things. So as I said at the Maynard Fine thing, that um, uh, I share one thing with Ellis Barker, and I, I'm proud of that. Um, we both never passed an audition. <laughs> uh, but I'm so unlikely. I'm not a, not a keyboard person. I'm not a singer. And um, uh, still, somehow, by the grace of God, I was able to come up with these wonderful singers and wonderful choirs that did nothing. So my major job, of course, was teaching at West Ottawa for 31 years, the only real job I ever had. Um, I did some teaching before that um, when I was in school and so on, but really, West Ottawa, I, uh, I got started right at the ground root, the, the, at the ground level, when West Ottawa became a high school, and, or, or I should say, when West Ottawa became a school district. And um, so I was the one of two music teachers that did instrumentals, other Gail did choral, Gradually developed, I was able to grow with it, which was a great blessing for me. So, became department chair and then coordinator and so on. And I find, I find most of my, many of my associates and many of my co um, colleagues and peers are, are, whether they're willing to admit it or whether they even know it, are climbing the ladder. You know, well, climbing the ladder is something foreign. said, if I could just get this one college job, or if I could just get my group to sing and this or that or the next thing, then I can be happy. That's not it. You, you take what you have, where you are, do the best you can with it, and trust God for the results. That's my, my philosophy. Well, our family motto is Genesis 12, 2. 
which says, God says to Abraham, I will bless you and you will be a blessing. And that's been our motto, our family motto. We have been so blessed in many different ways that we are responsible for reaching out and blessing other people. And that's been our motto and also our joy. We've had so much fun uh, doing that. And more recently, um, since we, uh, Ginger Juries and I published this book, we've been doing workshops all over the United States, helping people know how to care for other people who are going through a life crisis, like divorce or a serious illness or their kids are going off to college or any of the crises in life. Um, that's what our workshop is about. And so I think basically I've always been a teacher and I love it. That's my passion, helping other people be the best they can be. Well, I, I'm a product of Zealand and I grew up in Zealand and um, was part of a very small family woodworking shop, which uh, I eventually ended up uh, after a, a number of false starts uh, going into in the mid 60s. And ever since then, my my, my adult career has been uh, building and leading ODL Incorporated. I didn't get to a point where I said, "Okay, I need a cake and a watch now," uh, because I'm 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 out of here. Uh, it's still a family business, and I still go there and drink coffee from time to time. Uh, I talk with people, although I don't have any uh, of the hard responsibilities that go along with drawing and leading it. So my my career has been sort of a sort of a drifting away, I guess. And as I was drifting away from ODL, which I'm still not completely drifted away from, I was drifting into some other things that uh, provided a lot of satisfaction for me and for both Karen and I. And, and also, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was blessing some other people in the process. One of our models at ODL is to be solid, soft, and risky. And if you, if you want to be a successful company, you need to take some risks. And if you take the risks, your chances are you'll have a successful company. But it's only when you take the risks and are successful that you can be soft. And the soft is where we're at now. And we can be the soft part uh, almost completely. And that's what we enjoy doing. Probably one of the main things, one of our passions then, is Water Missions International in Charleston. And they make a water filtration system for developing countries. And one of these systems can supply fresh water to a village of three to 5,000. And water crisis in the world is just near and dear to our hearts because one billion people are without safe, clean water. Larry's on the board there at Water Missions, and we've taken several work groups there to build the machines because the company uses volunteer labor for it all. And we've taken several groups to Chiapas. That's our, air, our area of focus as far as the country. And I think, um, tell me a little bit about your proposal. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is a modest proposal, and it's Michigan Stadium. And there was a time a few years ago when Karen and I went with our kids to a Michigan football game. And as we sat in that stadium and we saw this huge group of people, 100,000 people, we thought, gee, wouldn't that be interesting if we could supply water systems for 100,000 people in Chiapas? So I wrote this, we wrote this proposal together and put it out and sort of been quasi-published. Uh, but it meant that we had to try to find the funding and the and the manpower and the machines for uh, between 30 and 35 villages in Chiapas. And we have recently reached that point where there are 30 villages now that have a water system. So this drove us for quite a while. This was done in 08. Uh, we thought it was going to be a, a five-year project, but uh, we're beyond it at this point. So that's been a kind of a fun success story for us as far as philanthropic.